Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I just want to thank uh, Norwalk SDA Church for such a warm welcome. I want to thank Lido and his family for housing me. These guys put me up in like a five-star hotel, and they showed me the room I was staying in. I was like, is this a joke or something? This is like the best room in the house, and got my own bathroom, and they brought me breakfast in bed. It was just too sweet. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, and thank you all so much for your warm welcome. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm privileged to be a part of this Latter Rain Revival series. And this is, of course, the second installment. Last night, my brother uh, gave a message talking about sort of the nuts and bolts of the Latter Rain. And today, we're going to be getting into a message called The Loud Cry. Has anybody ever heard of the Loud Cry message? Okay, so we're going to be talking about the loud cry today, but before we get into it, what do we need to do? We got to pray. So I'm going to go to my knees. Those who are willing and able, please join me. Our loving Father, we come before your awesome throne with fear and trembling, but we come in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. We ask that you would please forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there be anything in between our heart and yours that is keeping us from hearing this message, I pray that you remove it in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray that you would please let it not be my words that are heard, but may it be your words that are heard today. Please hide me behind your cross and please, for your sake, Lord, give us your Holy Spirit in abundance we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. I want to start by going to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And here we have the three angels' messages. What we're told by inspiration to be the mighty cleaver of truth that has cut the Seventh-day Adventist church out and this is the message that we are to bring to the world. Um, the first angel's message gives us something very important. It gives us the foundation of these messages. It says in verse 6, I'm in Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the three angels' messages starts out with the everlasting what? Gospel. This is the engine that will drive the three angels' messages. If we don't understand the gospel and we don't get the first angel's message, do you think we'll have any luck getting the second angel's message? No. If we don't get the second angel's message, do you think we're going to have luck getting the third angel's message? No. What about the fourth angel's message in Revelation 18? No. We're not going to have any luck if we don't get the gospel of Jesus Christ correct. And we're going to look at that from the Bible today. Now, if we... Scoot on down to the end of the three angels' messages. We see this. It says in verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I think I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I want to turn the mic down or maybe the treble down or something. Okay. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, we use this verse in the Seventh-day Adventist church frequently. This is like the, the, the pillar of our faith, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this is the third angel's message. This is the message that happens just before verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. 
This is the message that happens just before Christ Jesus ascends from the clouds and thrusts in his sickle and reaps. It is the Advent message. Is that clear from the Scriptures? So this message is very important. Now, what exactly does it mean to have to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us that... Let's see if I could get this. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119 and 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. Do you know Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That means that in order to inherit the kingdom of God, we must be righteous. We must be in line with God's commandments. Righteousness or right doing is something that is required for us to gain access into heaven. Okay? And it would seem like an impossible task. I once thought it was an impossible task in my life. I'll tell a little bit of my testimony later, but for now, there's two definitions that the Bible gives us of righteousness. One is a thing, which is the law of God, and the other is a person, which is Jesus Christ. This message of the third angel is righteousness by faith. And the faith that we're being asked to acquire here is the faith of who? Jesus. We will be victorious over sin in proportion to how much faith we exercise. None of us here are capable of exercising that faith to be completely victorious over sin. But one person did exercise the faith which is necessary to be victory over sin. And who was that? Jesus Christ. Therefore, we need his faith. This is the loud cry message. It is the message of righteousness by faith. Now, if we skip to Revelation chapter 18, this is the message we read about last night that is accompanied by power. Now, according to the book of Acts chapter 1, power comes by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, there must be a latter rain that enables us to go and bring this gospel this message of justification or righteousness by faith to the world. We read in verse 1, And after these things, I'm in Revelation 18, verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. If we look in verse 4, we read what we're calling people to do. It says in verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, that's Babylon, my people. God has beloved saints in the Babylonian system. And this is the message that they must hear in order to arouse their hearts to come out of Babylon. So is this an important message? Absolutely, this is an important message. Now, This message was the center of controversy in the early Seventh-day Adventist church. We're going to talk a little bit about history today. This is going to be a Bible study as well as a history lesson. But does anybody recognize these gentlemen that I have up here? Anybody at all? Even if you say, I recognize at least one of these guys. Okay. On the left here, we have A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. At the time this happened, in the 1880s, they were very young men. They were in their 30s. And on our right, we have the older gentlemen in the church at that time. We have Uriah Smith and G.I. Butler, who was the conference president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the time that these young men came preaching righteousness by faith. And this caused division in our church. Because our church was suffering from something in that day called legalism. You guys heard of that before? Okay? Nowadays, it's like if you're vegan, you get called a legalist. Or if you're wearing a skirt, if you're a woman and you're wearing a skirt, you get called a legalist. That's not legalism. We're going to find out what real legalism is. We're going to look at textbook legalism from some of our pioneers. And these were men who loved the Lord and they had good intentions. But we have to remember that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You could be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. Okay? So these men on our right here, 
they rose up against this message of righteousness by faith. Now, we're going to look at both messages today. One of them is proved by the Bible to be true, and the other is proved to be false and very dangerous and deadly. Now, this was the, the controverted text, our scripture reading. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be what? Let me hear you guys. Justified by works. By faith. Okay, I just want to make sure you guys are, are paying attention. So, we are justified by faith. It's a fact of Scripture. But the, the third angel's message describes a people who are keeping the commandments of God. So, we have to find out how this works. And let me show you the ideas that these men had in those days. This is from uh, June 11, 1889. From the Review and Herald, this is Brother Uriah Smith, again, a solid pillar of our church, but again, you could be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. Now, I want you to listen to what he says here. He's going to say some things that I think we're all going to agree with, and then he's going to say other things that might make you kind of scratch your head and say, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. Listen to what he says. He says, the law is spiritual, holy, just, and good. Would you guys agree? Amen. That's, that's just quoting Scripture. He says, the divine standard of righteousness. Would you agree? Amen. That's from the Scriptures as well. Then he says, perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness, and that is the only way anyone can attain to righteousness. What do you guys think about that? Can you believe that we were thinking this in, in those days? Okay. He believed that by keeping the law of God, he had a zeal for the law of God. He believed that by keeping it, we will somehow become righteous, okay? And he had certain scriptures he was quoting to try to justify this, but we have to look at the entirety of scripture and look at it in context and see what it means. Now, he also said, there is a righteousness we must have. Is that true? It is true, but look what he says. In order to see the kingdom of heaven, which is called our righteousness, and this righteousness comes from being in harmony with the law of God. What do you guys think? This is not how the Bible teaches righteousness comes. Okay? I want to show you something. A week after this editorial was published, someone asked Ellen White, who in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and our fundamental beliefs, we understand that Ellen White is a prophet of God, so a good, good source to ask. They say, what does Brother Smith's piece in the review mean? They looked at this and they are scratching their head and saying, is this true? Hey, Sister White, have you had any light on this? What does this mean? This is what Sister White said. She said, he doesn't know what he is talking about. He sees trees as men walking. It is impossible for us to exalt the law of Jehovah unless we, hold, we take hold on what? The righteousness of Christ. This is Christ's righteousness, the third angel's message, which will be accompanied by the latter rain power and go out to the world in the loud cry message. Okay? Now, notice what she says here, though. She says, he sees men walking as trees. Now, this is a reference to Mark chapter 8, I think it is, when Jesus heals the blind man. When he first touches him, he can see a little bit, but it's blurry. And when our vision is blurred, something like a man walking by, if I've never seen a man before, or it's been a really long time, if, I, if my vision is blurred, I could kind of understand how that might look like a tree walking, right? Especially my brother, who's like six foot three, you would see just like a tree walking by like this, right? But what she's trying to illustrate here is that he could see some things. Uriah Smith could see some things, and he had some truth in his message, but that truth was mingled with deadly error. Does that make sense? Are you guys following me so far? Okay, now, let's see how this works. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, and we're going to see some scriptures that I think Uriah Smith probably didn't know what to do with, because Paul the Apostle makes this very clear. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 19. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped 
and all the world may become guilty before God. So Paul is simply telling us what the law does. It stops the mouth of the transgressor. transgressor. It says, you are not righteous. You have sinned and become guilty of transgression and are condemned to death. The Bible says that sin, in 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter uh, 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. So what the law can do is stop the mouth and say, you're condemned to death by transgression. Okay? Verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law has the power to show us what sin is. And that's it. It can simply condemn us and show us that we are guilty. Now remember, Paul the Apostle also says that the law is just and holy and good. I'm not trying to trample the law of God here by what I'm saying. But we have to get it right in our heads how this works. Okay? Are you guys following me? The law condemns of, condemns of sin, condemns to death the sinner. But there is a righteousness. I don't want to read that yet. Let's go forward in, in Romans. Okay. Okay. It says in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So what Paul the Apostle is telling us is that there is righteousness of the law which is revealed separately from the law. Remember, the law is a thing, but there's a righteousness which is revealed in a person, okay? There's a righteousness of the law revealed outside of the law. That's what he's saying. Then in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of the law that is outside of the law, but the law agrees with. Look what, it, look what it says again in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Is anybody confused at that? There's a righteousness which exists outside the law, but the law agrees with. And this is that righteousness. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 23 and verse 6, in his, in his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our what? Righteousness. So, what Uriah Smith and G.I. Butler were making a mistake in is that they were looking at the law trying to acquire righteousness. But that's not how it works. That's putting the cart before the horse. We must go to the law giver, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and we must receive his righteousness. Then we'll have a chance of being able to keep the law. Okay? So at this time, our church had become quite legalistic in trying to save ourselves with the law, and that's what Jones and Wagner came to help us get through. Now, we read through that. Now, this is the, the other side. These are the young men. This was the message that they were bringing. Listen to what E.J. Wagner says here. This is from the General Conference Bulletin. He says, there is but one thing in this world that a man needs, and that is justification. Justification means to be made righteous or right in the eyes of God. He says, and justification is a fact, not a theory. It is the gospel. The whole purpose of that God had when he sent Jesus to this world is to make man right with God again. Amen? When we first fell into sin, perhaps God could have said, well, I'll leave them to their own death and destruction. But no, Jesus stepped down and he said, I will, let, I will have the sins of them fall upon me. I will pay the penalty for them. This was all the purpose of God in the plan of redemption is to make man right with him. So when he says it is the gospel, it is the gospel. The good news is that we could be justified freely by God's grace. Amen? 
Come on, that's not enough, guys. Um, amen? Okay. He says this. That which does not tend to righteousness is of no avail and not worthy to be preached. Remember, Paul the Apostle says, if you're not righteous, you won't go to heaven. So as far as the, the sinner is, is concerned, the condemned sinner, the only thing that matters is righteousness. That will be what will give us access into heaven. That which does not tend to righteousness is of no avail and not worthy to be preached. Righteousness can only be attained through what? Faith. Consequently, all things worthy to be preached must tend to justification by faith. It is the third angel's message. It will be the loud cry message when, we, when it is accompanied with the Holy Spirit. And it is the only way that a sinner can be made right with God is by faith in the atoning sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, the worry in these older gentlemen in our church at this time was that Jones and Wagner may have been teaching like a form of cheap grace, that now because we have sinned, it is okay to, or excuse me, now because we have been saved by faith, it is okay to transgress God's law. But that's not at all what they were teaching. Now, I want to show what exactly justification is in the Bible, what it's synonymous with. Come with me to uh, Romans chapter 4 now, and we're going to read starting in verse 1. Romans 4 and verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So were people saved differently in the Old Testament? Were they saved by their works in the Old Testament and by faith in the New Testament? What do you guys think? It's by faith. No matter where you are in the stream of time, Old Testament or New Testament or today, it's by faith. Even Abraham, our patriarch, was saved by faith. It says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh it is, it is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if I'm trying to work my way to salvation, all I'm doing is accumulating more debt to the law. Okay, verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Look what he says in verse 7, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. This is justification by faith. The reason why we cannot be justified in and of ourselves, the reason why we can't be justified by our works is because justification is synonymous with forgiveness. The law has been transgressed. God has provided a way that he can forgive transgressors because the only other option outside of receiving God's forgiveness is receiving eternal death. Are you guys following me? Therefore, justification by faith is synonymous with forgiveness. That's why nobody can justify themselves in the sight of God. That's why our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Amen? Okay. Blessed are them to whom the Lord will not impute sin, it says in verse 8. So, Sister White says in Faith and Works, page 103, Pardon, that's forgiveness of sin, and justification are one and the same thing. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of Christ Jesus. Not because of any inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him as his child by adoption. Isn't that beautiful? So... Since we're justified by faith and not by works, does that give us license to sin? What do you guys think? No. Here's what the Bible says. Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. 
Yea, we establish the law. So the book of Romans, which is teaching justification by faith, righteousness by faith, teaches that through justification by faith, the law is established in God's people. We establish the law, not by our own works, but by faith in Christ. He also says this in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Titus chapter 3 tells us about justification by faith being something that transforms the heart. Now, I said that justification is synonymous with what? Forgiveness. In order for me to be right in the eyes of God, none of my works will avail, but God's forgiveness will avail. Amen? Now, have you ever done something real bad to someone? Please don't share this publicly, but just think to yourself. Have you ever done something really bad to someone and your conscience got you and you just said, wow, I, I did that person dirty. I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that. Whatever it is, and you've come to that person you got the courage to come to them and say, look, brother, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I, I feel bad about that. And will you please forgive me? And they say, oh, of course, of course, sister. Or of course, brother. You know, I forgive you. Don't worry about it. Water under the bridge. Does that feel good when someone forgives us? Is that powerful in our lives? I remember one time uh, one of, in my early years when I was experimenting with, with marijuana, I came home and I had put eye drops in so that my parents didn't know what I was doing, or so I thought they wouldn't, but mothers always know, trust me. And I was trying to walk by my mom, just quickly go to my room so she couldn't see that my eyes were red from using drugs. And, and she said, Shay. And I stopped and I look at her and she says, have you been smoking? And I said, yes, I have. And she said the worst thing I think I could have heard. She said, well, she said, we're going to wait till your father gets home and you can tell him what you've done. My dad was at work. And when my dad was going to come home, I was going to have to come to him and say, dad, mom caught me. I was smoking marijuana. And I was absolutely terrified. I did not want to tell my dad that, but I did. And my dad, you know, lectured me and, and told me what a mistake I have made and how that, you know, drugs and alcohol and things like that are never going to get me anywhere. But then my dad forgave me. And kind of after he had seen me, you know, just absolutely saddened by his, his rebuke of me, he said, he started, he didn't actually say, I forgive you, son, but I, I know when my dad has forgiven me, when he starts joking around with me and being playful and stuff. And as soon as I sensed that my father had forgiven me, it was so powerful in my, my life, it made me not want to do the thing again. It was different than if a parent just said, you know, if they just gave you the belt and then threw you in your room and didn't say anything else. It was when I sensed that my father had forgiven me for what I did, that's when the power was there. Now, I want you to think about this. If a mortal sinner can have that type of impact when they forgive us, what about the impact when a divine, holy, righteous God, the king of the universe, forgives us? Do you think there's power in that? There is power in justification by faith. It's not just pardon of sins. It's not just, okay, the books of heaven have crossed out that sin that you've done and go your merry way now. No, something happens. If it's true justification by faith, there is a transformation of heart. Look what it says in Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing. Listen to the terminology, washing of regeneration. That's the giving of a new heart and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being what? justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you know when David wanted forgiveness from God, his prayer was, create in me, what? A clean heart. That's a true heart of forgiveness. That's our true heart of, of confession. Lord, I don't want you to just scratch the sin out in the books of heaven. I want you to change me so I don't do that anymore. Amen? Justification is done by a declaration of God. 
The same God who declares us righteous is the same God who spoke the worlds into existence. It's the same God who breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living soul. Do you think that when he speaks, my daughter Paulette is justified, do you think that there's a change in her heart? Absolutely. There's new creation in the heart when God forgives the sin. Are you guys hearing me? Sister White says this. This shows whose side she was on. Now, we have turmoil in our church today. We shouldn't really be like picking sides like this is some sort of sports game or something. We have a mission, right? We need to stay focused. But she couldn't help but agree with Jones and Wagner. And this is what she said. She said in Testimonies to Ministers, page 91, she said, The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. So what was this message presenting? It was not giving any man room to glory and say, wow, you're really keeping the law good, Brother Smith or Brother Butler. No, it was saying, hey, Uriah Smith, no matter how hard you try, you can never justify yourself by your works. And what that does is it crushes a man's ego and lays him in the dust. And he didn't like that. He did not like that. He rose up against this message. But Sister White had their back on this. She says, it presented, speaking of this most precious message, she says, it presented justification through faith in the surety, that's Jesus. It invited the people to receive what? Help me, people. It the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to the commandments of God, in all the commandments of God. So do you see, if we put the cart before the horse and we say, I'm going to white knuckle my way to righteousness, we will never be righteous. But if we come to Jesus, the surety, and we see him uplifted on the cross, a transformation takes place in the heart and God will enable us to obey him. But if it's not by a loving uh, obedience, if it's not by a loving relationship, it will never happen. There's no such thing that God does not grant obedience outside of a loving relationship with him. It's just, it's impossible. Simply can't do it. Many had lost sight, speaking of this message and the controversy in our church at this time, she said many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. Amen? They were looking at the law, the law, the law, and they forgot about the lawgiver. She says about this message in Evangelism 190, she says, this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the what? The third angel's message, the faith of Jesus and the commandments of God. This is the message that Jones and Wagner came preaching to our church, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, that's the loud cry, and attended with what? The outpouring of the Spirit in large measure. So, this is the loud cry message of justification by faith. Now, how is true justification by faith activated? That's the question we're going to answer now. So many people, they say, well, I've been, I've been in the church for a long time, and I've been struggling, whether it be pornography, smoking, lying, cheating, whatever it may be. It's between you and God. Or maybe we say, I don't really see any sin in myself. I think I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just chilling in the church and waiting until Jesus came back. Either way, whatever your situation is, we want to be, make sure that the type of justification that we're receiving is actually a work of God and not a work of ourselves. Because I can look, I can find someone I bet who sins more than me if I search hard enough. It, it would be a rare thing, but I bet you I can find someone who I can say, they, they definitely sin more than me. But if we're looking horizontally like this, of course we're going to be able to justify ourselves in our own minds. But what we need to start doing is looking vertically. We need to start looking up and seeing the fullness of the stature of Christ's character. And when we see that, it will silence our lips at fault finding in our brethren. What it will do is make us say, wow, I need Jesus. I need a transformation of heart. Amen? So how is true justification by faith uh, 
acquired. Now, I want to share a little bit of my personal testimony. Um, as uh, Lito mentioned earlier, I, uh, I was raised in a somewhat Christian environment, and when I got a little bit older in my teenage years, I started trying alcohol and cigarettes and marijuana and different things like this. I was listening to a lot of rock music and R&B and different things that made my mind go away from the Bible. I ended up going to uh, college, and at college I learned things like evolution and anthropology and these things that showed me that the Bible must be a fairy tale book, and it could not be scientifically accurate. It could not have any true historical wisdom in it. I was starting to become scholarly in my mind, and I started to go that way, all the while leaving my faith behind, and I just completely indulged my flesh. I was a fornicator, a blasphemer, a liar, a drunk, um, all of these things, but I was starting to become successful in the career that I wanted. I wanted to be a film composer, and I was also, at the time, I was, well, in my college years, I was, uh, my undergrad is in jazz, and my graduate's degree was in music composition, and my goal was to be a film composer, but I was also playing in, in different venues around the Los Angeles area. And so I had a couple of streams of in income. I had an internship lined up after college. I had everything that I thought I needed and wanted and desired. And then I realized one day that I was absolutely miserable. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense. I have everything I want. Every, all my dreams are being achieved. And I feel absolutely anxious and depressed. And I became like a hypochondriac. I thought everything was killing me. I thought I had cancer like 10 times. I just became like this worried, frustrated, depressed mess. And I developed sciatica at this time, which for those who may not know, sciatica is when you have like a little pinched nerve. Well, it's actually a very big nerve uh, in, the, in your spine, and it goes all the way down to your foot. So you start getting a pain in your back, and then it it radiates all the way down to your feet, and it could cripple you if it's bad enough. And here I was, like a 23-year-old man, walking around like I was 90 years old, completely depressed. No offense to any 90-year-olds, but I was 23, and I was walking this way. So I find myself in this position where I seem to have everything coming my way, but I'm absolutely depressed. And so one day I said, I felt it upon me, to search the Bible. I said, I have to know what this Jesus says about himself. Because when I was growing up, I was given a gospel that was just, oh yeah, believe Jesus. And if you believe Jesus, someday you'll be in heaven with him. And I think my thought was just like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. But I never had any type of relationship with him. I did not have my own connection to him. Until one day, in my broken, miserable, painful state, I opened up a Bible that my mom had gifted me that I almost never opened up. And for some reason, I felt compelled to get on the floor. I don't know why to this day, in my mind why, but I believe it was the Holy Spirit. And I just get on the ground like this, on my floor in my room, and I open up the Bible and I start reading. And there's these cross references in my Bible that are taking me all over the place. And I wanted to go to the red letters of the Bible, so I'm just doing the cross-references in all the Gospels and seeing what this Jesus man said about himself. And I'm flipping around, and I'm starting to read it, and I'm kind of praying at the same time, like, God, show me. Like, what do you want me to know? Show me. Please show me, God. And all of a sudden, I start reading the Bible a little bit differently. I start saying, wow, it kind of feels like it's talking to me. And so I'm like, wow, this is interesting. I need to keep reading this. And I'm reading and reading, and I'm reading the parables of Jesus. I'm reading. I'm just all over the place in the Gospels. I'm following one cross-reference to the next and just going around. And all of a sudden, I just feel this immense emotion come over me that someone is talking to me right now. A supernatural force is speaking to me right now directly from these pages. And I begin to weep. I'm laying there on the floor like this, reading, and I just begin to weep. As I'm weeping, I come across Luke chapter 6, and my eyes go directly to verse 21. 
And it says, blessed are they that hunger now, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they that weep now. And I said, wow, that's me. I'm weeping right now. And all of a sudden, I just feel so joyful because at this point, I'm certain God is talking to me. I'm like, wow, this is the actual God of the universe showed up in my room. He's talking to me. And I feel this immense joy come over me. And I start laughing from the joy. So here I am with all this, you know, tears coming down my face. And I'm laughing. I'm on the ground on my hands and knees. I look like an absolute insane person. But God was visiting me. And so I'm sitting here. And I'm, I'm calming down from the laughter. And I look and I, and I say, see right after where it says, Blessed are ye that weep now. It says, For ye shall laugh. And at that point, I shot up like this. And I said, Well, he really is here. He's really here. He just called me out on weeping and laughing. And he said, I'll be blessed if I do those things. And at that time, the Holy Spirit came into my presence. And I began to realize why I was miserable. I was miserable because everything I did, every sentence I uttered, every goal that I had, career goal, relationship goal, All of it was self-centered. Everything was for my own glory. Everything was for my own pleasure. I realized I was an absolute rotten person. And before this, I kind of thought of myself as like a good guy. I thought, yeah, I believe on Jesus. I'm a good person. I'll go to heaven someday, you know. But now I realize, whoa, I'm not a good guy. I'm a bad guy. And I began to weep like I've never weeped before. Maybe I've weeped once or twice the way that I did that time. And I said, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I said, I've been serving myself this whole time, and that's why I'm miserable. But you deserve me, Lord. You deserve to have every bit of me. I want to serve you from now on. And that day, I pledged myself to serve the Lord, and immediately... He opened up doors for me to serve in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Immediately, it was like I just, like something clicked in me. I had to go out. I was out on the streets with steps to Christ in my hand. This is how excited I was. I was out on the street corners. I I put a little uh, tent up. I brought my brother with me. You could ask him about this. I I think I embarrassed him so bad. But I had a, a big tent up, and I had a little table, and I had a bunch of steps to Christ. And I went out, and I had poster boards like this big uh, all, all around the table. One of them had the three angels' message, messages on it. One of them had, you know, a few gospel verses like, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I had that on one of the posters, and I was just there, and I had one poster that said, come and let us pray over you. And I had this all set up, and I was standing on the street corners yelling, get to know Jesus before he returns. Get to know Jesus. And I was walking up to cars in traffic, handing them steps to Christ, saying, read this book. Read your Bible. Jesus is coming soon. And my brother Sonny is just kind of like. But he, he had a conversion experience, too, and then his zeal you know, came to match mine. And we've been doing evangelism ever since. So I know about justification by faith, not just from a superficial reading of the scriptures. I know because God came to me and visited me in my room at my lowest point and showed me justification by faith. Now, we now have a ministry called The Bridegroom Cometh. This is me and my brother and our brother brother from another mother, Zeke, and God is doing amazing things. He's opening up doors for us to go to churches all over California, and now he's been opening up. We've been to Guatemala one time with amazing facts. Um, We've been to Idaho. My brother is now going to Indiana. I mean, he's just opening it up. Why? Because that which does not tend to righteousness should not be preached at the pulpit. And all me and my brother do, we're one-trick ponies. We preach the righteousness of Christ. If we're preaching about the Sabbath, we fit in the righteousness of Christ. If we're preaching about the state of the dead, we're going to fit in the righteousness of Christ. If we're preaching about the sanctuary message, it's about the righteousness of Christ. It must consume every aspect of our lives because it's the most important thing. It's God's gift to humanity. Don't you want to receive it? God is good. 
Now, I needed to hear verses like this. When I was living in the world and I was just told this gospel that my sins have been pardoned because I have a superficial belief in Jesus Christ, I needed to hear verses like this. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know it's been five years since I've had a cigarette or alcohol uh, or any type of drugs? Amen. Glory to God, amen? Amen. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of victory over sin. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not in our sins. Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, uh, unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And Philippians 4, 13, one of our favorites, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So if you're saying I've been addicted to pornography for years and I can't bust the habit. Don't say I can't. Let your language be I can through Christ. Amen? If you're still struggling with smoking, if you're struggling with lying, if you're struggling with a sinful relationship, God can give you victory. But we have too many people standing at the pulpit today preaching a pardon gospel where the pardon has no power in it. But God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act in the courts of heaven. It is not just a saving from, it's not just a saving from condemnation, it's a saving from sin, a reclaiming from sin. Amen? Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the Greek word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite. If dynamite exploded in this room right now, you better believe you're going to see a change in the room. Amen? If God's gospel is received in the heart, you better believe you're going to see a change in the heart. Amen? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is what? Help me, people. The righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, how is, how is justification activated? That was our question, right? And I went on this whole tangent to bring us here. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, 456.3. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God, not man. Amen? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man, where? In the dust, and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. It need, leaves no room for ego, for pride, for selfishness. It lays us in the dust. And I think that, my friends, I don't think, I know. That's why the Holy Spirit told me when I came before the Lord to receive my justification for that very first time, the Holy Spirit said, get low, son. Because you're coming before the God of the universe right now. If you notice any time a man comes before the glory of the Lord in the Bible, he gets on his face. You look at Job, who in chapter 1, he is called perfect and upright before the Lord. But when he sees the glory of the Lord, he says, I am abhorrent. He was laid low to the ground. What about when Isaiah is naming all the sins of Israel... And then it says that the glory of the Lord was shown before him. And what does he say? He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I am undone. He was laid low. When Ezekiel saw the wheel, laid low. What about Peter? When he saw Jesus face to face. When he finally realized the implications of the man that he was following around, what Jesus was, who he was, and what he was doing, what did Peter do? He fell to the ground and he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Friends, when we come before the glory of the Lord, we are laid in the dust and our heart is changed and we are justified by faith. Second Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the what? The glory of the Lord are what? 
changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 1.18. Oh, this isn't 2 Corinthians 1.18. I'm sorry. I forgot to change the verse. <clears throat> That's a typo. But it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is what? The power of God. There is power in the cross of Calvary, my friends, and I'll tell you why. Because if by seeing the glory of God a man is laid, to the du- laid in the dust and justified by faith, there is no other place you can look past, present, or future outside of the cross of Calvary where the, God, where the, where the glory of God was shown more prominently. When the Son of God, the spotless Lamb of God, was suspended above the earth on that cross, and he had been ridiculed, he had been betrayed, he had been spit on, he had been uh, reproached, he had been mocked, he had been beaten, and above all of that, he was suffering the wrath of God, the separation from the Father that he had been with through all eternity. And out of his mouth came, forgive them. We can't even drive in traffic without cursing someone. And this man had all the weight of humanity's sins upon his shoulder, and all he could think about was, I want them to be saved. His enemies who hated him, who pierced his side, I just want you to be saved. If we can behold that, Sin will melt from our cold, dark hearts. The cross of Calvary, our Lord, is an all-consuming fire, and our hearts are ice. What happens when ice comes near the fire? It melts. And I can tell you that one day, I went my whole life thinking, I'm all good. I, I believe in Jesus. I'm all good. I did good things. I really did. If you were to ask someone, what type of guy is Shay? Oh, he's a nice guy. He's the type of guy who will give you the shirt off his back. But guess what? I was a bad man. My motives were selfish. I had hate in my heart. I'm not standing up here saying I'm completely perfect. There is sanctification in our life where we grow in this grace that he gives us. But I can tell you, based on what I've seen him do in my life in the past, I know that in the future he can get rid of every single last sin out of my life. Amen? This is the power of the cross. Sister White says in Maranatha, page 99, she says, The theme that attracts the heart of the sinner is Christ and him crucified. (laughs) On the cross of Calvary, Jesus stands revealed to the world an unparalleled love. I'm telling you, you will not find the glory of God. You will not find the divine attributes being displayed to humanity more clear than the cross of Calvary. You cannot see greater love than that. So don't bother looking elsewhere. Present him, she says. Present him thus to the hungering multitudes and the height of his love will win men from darkness to light, from transgression to obedience and true holiness. Beholding Jesus upon the cross of Calvary arouses the conscience to the heinous character of sin as nothing else can do. I want to tell you guys, this just happened to me yesterday. Yesterday in preparation for this message, I was feeling kind of distant from God. You know what I'm talking about when sometimes you're like, man, I feel like my prayers aren't even going past the ceiling. I feel like my devotion just doesn't feel right. And I said, you know what? I'm going to persist in prayer. That's what I said, because the Bible tells us to be persistent in prayer. Sometimes God teaches us lessons by having us persist before he reveals himself to us. And so I persisted in prayer, and my prayer above all things was, Lord, show me your cross. Show me your cross. Show me your cross. I thought of Brother E.J. Wagner. You know, before he brought that message to our church, he had an experience. He was at a camp meeting in the Adventist church, 
and he was listening to Ellen White speak. What a privilege that would have been, right? But he said, all of a sudden, I couldn't hear Ellen White. I couldn't hear anything. I didn't know anybody was around me. I was alone, and before me was presented the cross of Calvary. And in that moment, this is a true story. He documented this multiple times. This is how he received the 1888 message of righteousness by faith. He said, before him was presented Christ uplifted on the cross. And in that moment... He did not realize that Christ died for him or for her or for anybody. In that moment, he realized Christ died specifically for him. And it melted his heart. He fell on the rock, Christ Jesus, and was broken. And God lifted him back up and set him on his way to go and preach this message. And that's what I was praying. This is yesterday this happened. I was just praying, God, show me the cross of Calvary. Show me the cross of Calvary. Let me get near to that cross of Calvary. And I opened up my Bible to the, the crucifixion account in the, in the book of Mark. And I start reading it. And God answered my prayers. I saw more vividly than I have since that time I was laying on the ground my first justification experience, I was shocked at what I was seeing them do to Jesus in that account, like I never have been before. My conscience was aroused like it never has been before. And I'm telling you, my friends, impulsively, it felt like I could not even help it. Impulsively, I I jumped off of my bed and I got on the ground and I laid flat on my face and wept bitterly for my sin. But oh, did the joy of the Lord come over me. In that moment, I imagine that's what heaven will be like 24-7. In that moment that my sins were forgiven and I really had that encounter with Christ, I imagine that's what heaven will be like, the joy that I felt. That was yesterday in preparation for this. God is good. A couple more quotes and we'll finish here. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 193. Justification by faith, this is the loud cry message, is to many a mystery. A sinner is justified by God when he repents of his sins. Is that works-based salvation? No. The repentance is a gift of God, amen? Happens when we see the cross and we see Christ bearing our sins. She says, why all the suffering? The law of Jehovah has been broken. The law of God's government in heaven and earth has been transgressed and the penalty of sin is pronounced to be death. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, what love, what matchless love. Christ, the Son of God, dying for guilty man. She says, this display of grace and the gift of salvation to the world fills the sinner with amazement. That's how I was yesterday, guys. And a few times that I come to see that closeness of the cross, sin melts in my heart. She says, this love of God to man breaks every barrier down. He comes to the cross, which has been placed midway between divinity and humanity, and repents of his sins of transgression because Christ has been drawing him to himself. He does not expect the law, like G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith, he does not expect the law to cleanse him from sin. For there is no pardoning quality in the law to save the transgressor of the law. He looks to the atoning sacrifice of his only hope through the repentance toward God. Because the law of the government has been broken and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who can save and cleanse the sinner from every transgression. Do we believe that? Amen. There is only one way to deal with sin. It's through the cross of Calvary. If we're just making reforms in our lives, saying, I'm going to change the way I speak. I'm going to change the things I eat. I'm going to change the way I dress. I'm going to try my best to change the way I treat people. And we just turn away from our sin, but there is no transformation of heart. Guess what? Atheists make reformations, guys. Buddhists make reformations. New Agers make reformations, right, brother? People can make reformations. But what God is looking for is a transformed heart. And there is no other way to enter into the sanctuary where we see our salvation 
than through the burnt offering, which represents the cross of Calvary. Amen? That is why Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep them. If there is no love for me and you try to keep my commandments, that's your righteousness, not mine. Jesus is knocking on our hearts right now. Whenever the loud cry message is preached, the Holy Spirit is present. And he's in this room right now, and he's knocking on the hearts of every single one of us. Now Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever will open, I will come in and sup with him. Now if you invite someone to your house, let's say I invited you to my house should I expect you to cook for me and give me food if I'm inviting you to my house? No. So if we're inviting Jesus into our house, we have to have food for him to eat. Does anybody have food that, that is worthy of feeding Jesus? And does anybody have food worthy of feeding Jesus? Let me tell you something. The food, what Jesus is really wanting is the heart. And your heart is worthy of giving to Jesus. Do you know why? Because he purchased it with his righteous royal blood. And all he's asking for is for us to let him in and to receive Christ's righteousness. Who wants to receive Christ's righteousness? Raise your hand. If you want to actually make a commitment today and say, Lord, I have heard justification by faith. And I want to be justified, and I want a true and sincere justification. If that is your desire, come forward, and let's pray together. If you've sensed the Holy Spirit working in your heart, and you say, Lord, I want to come to the foot of the cross right now. If you come forward, we're going to pray, and I want you to expect... That when you come and you get on your knees and you ask the Lord, show me your glory. Like Moses, he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. He is a good God and a loving God and he wants to show us his glory. And when we see the glory of the Lord, that is when the transformation will happen. Amen? We've been dealing with sin wrong in our church. We've been trying to make reforms with no change of heart. Reforms are good. The Bible does preach living godly lives in this present world. So I'm not attacking the reforms of the church. But if there is no transformation of heart, it's pointless. And so what we need is to see the glory of God. Justification by faith is the laying of the glory of man in the dust and doing a work for him that he does not in his own power have to do. Let's pray. Loving Father God in heaven, I thank you that you are a friend to sinners. I thank you that you have given your Holy Spirit this morning, that you have spoken through this feeble and broken vessel who is not worthy to unloose your shoelace. Thank you for the gift of your son Jesus on the cross. Thank you for suffering for us. Lord, we come before you asking to see your glory. That is the only way to deal with sin, Lord, is to be belittled by seeing the cross of Calvary, but not just belittled, Lord, but empowered empowered to obey you, not from obligation, not from a want of heaven or a fear of hell, but because you're good. You are so loving. You are so kind. You're so patient. And even being the king of creation, the Lord of glory, you stepped down and humbled yourself in humanity for us. And we thank you for that, Lord. You forever identify with us as humanity, and you honored humanity by becoming one of us. You glorified humanity. Thank you for that, Father. 
I pray for every single heart here, Lord, please give us your Holy Spirit. Every single person who has come up, Lord, let them see your glory. And I want to see your glory, Lord. Give us a taste of heaven here on earth. Fill us with your spirit. I pray that you bless the rest of the, the meetings. I pray that we know the loud cry message, that we're ready to go bring it to all your faithful people in the Catholic Church, in the Presbyterian Church, in the Baptist Church, Buddhist, Hindu, the people who are looking for the truth, Lord, who need a message like this, that they may come into your fold. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in the only name in heaven or earth that can save us, Jesus Christ, amen.